that belonged to Athenaeum proprietors, um, I was I was really struck by how they were some of our best costumes. That the Athenaeum, uh, which after its first decade as its proprietors, had 80% of the top taxpayers in Portsmouth. So it was obviously on its way to becoming an elite institution in Portsmouth. And that's kind of borne out by the clothing that got saved at the Portsmouth Historical Society. And it turns out we had more overlap between Portsmouth Historical Society donors and um, the proprietors of the Athenaeum. Richard Candy told me, oh, you won't find any. <laughs> um, or not enough for an exhibit. Show them, and right? I have over 20 proprietors represented, or their spouses. And I think that was really, you know, and there were other portraits I could have included um, that from Strawberry Bank um, of women. And so I have pretty much left out proprietors of women except for Hannah Rogers, um, who, then her portrait belongs to the Athenaeum. And she's shown in her very fashionable paper shawl and bonnet and collar. And, but otherwise, the portraits are men because the museum's collection is rather deficient in men's um, clothing. And but we have we have quite a number of men's portraits. Um, Thomas Tredick here was a dry goods merchant um, in Dover, Philadelphia, and here um, in Portsmouth. He lived at the corner of State and Chestnut, right at the edge of the Negro burying grounds, um, in a house that had belonged to his um, father-in-law. He married um, two um, sisters. First, the first one died after seven children. Then he married her sister and had four more children, which is like, um, so I guess he deserved the house. But it was um, in his wife's name for most of his lifetime. But I, his portrait. Um, it's from the John Paul Jones house, and I particularly like his his sort of dapper white stock with his little pin, and his um, and it, it's presumably Joseph Greenleaf Cole at Sonny Cole, and he's um, just so dapper looking, aside from the fact that Cole painted his arms that look like they're going to screw off or something, <laughs> but um, <laughs> some defect in the painting. Um, <laughs> And so he was a proprietor, and then his son Charles Treddick was a proprietor, and his grandson Charles Brewster Treddick was a proprietor. And we have record representing his son's generation, um, this fur muff. This is from 1868. We have the original um, box. Abby Rowe um, was the Treddick. She married Charles Treddick, and I believe that Charles Treddick mailed her the box because the handwriting, we have his diary and her diary, the handwriting on the box looks very much like his handwriting. And he was working in Brooklyn, the fur companies in Brooklyn. This is ermine, a little tippet for going around her neck and a little muff. And she was, I think, quite small, because this is a very small muff, but she was small. Um, I think we have something that says, a passport or something that says she was like 5'2", so her little hands would fit in there. I had an intern who was about that size, and she thought the muff was just the right size for her. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, we, so we sort of see this sort of the, the, the progression of generations of, of proprietors and also donors to the Historical Society. Also related to the, this, the Trenick family, we then have the Brewsters, because um, Abby and Charles' daughter, Mary, um, Charles Brewster's son, and they, Charles Brewster is famous in Portsmouth, or rambles about Portsmouth, and I did borrow his portrait from the Whitworth Gardener house, and his carpet bag from the Wentworth Gardener house. This is the bag he carried around Portsmouth when he was a sem taking notes for his rambles, and the carpet bag's made out of figured Venetian carpet, and um, I don't know if it was originally made, you know, it was a carpet that got made into a carpet bag. Or they also did make carpet bags as it has a leather top. And this one has sort of the look of being made originally as a bag and never having been walked on. The, um, it's got a little note inside, Charles W. Brewster, Portsmouth Journal Office. So he, this was part of his business. Um, uh, a 
aside from journalism, Charles Brewster was also in the militia. And this hat has been in our collection um, for um, many years. It was a gift of Edith Brewster. And it, can, it the really rare thing about it is the plume. It looks like a feather duster, which <laughs> no longer will stand up. The plume is supposed to, it goes in the hole on top of the hat, and it is supposed to stand straight and tall on the hat. And it sort of goes, so it gets to lie down. Also, every time you pick it up, feathers fall out. It is, um, it, it's, it's, it's a rare survival. And the, um, it's, I read, I had to read up on, on these plumes. I knew nothing about them. So they're made of cock feathers, usually, and they, kept the long feathers for feather dusters, and the short ones were put into plumes like this. Because it certainly looks for all the world like a feather duster. Yes, yes. I No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> it's a plume. The thing that they were right. Yeah, right, yeah. right, right. So you can see Charles Brewster related to marriage to Thomas Tredick, by marriage eventually to Thomas Tredick. How different his dress has become. This is done in the 1840s the portrait, and he shows a very updated look. He wasn't, I think, terribly fashionable, but very proper looking gentleman. And I just needed his portrait to go with his objects. And there's a feather on the carpet bag. <laughs> <laughs> I think the feathers are flying around <laughs> while we're in there. <laughs> and static electricity. The, the, the neck piece here, yes. is that part of the shirt or is it separate? It's separate. Separate. The shirt has it. Well, the collar is part of the shirt, all nice and starched, and then the then you have the stock that goes around it and fastens oh, it back. Uh -huh. Is it always white or no? Well, oftentimes it's black. Uh huh. You have to face straight ahead, or can you turn? <laughs> well, I don't know. You could do much of anything in that, but <laughs> but women had to wear lots of uncomfortable clothes. The men at least deserve to have an uncomfortable I agree. collar. So over here, I'm gonna, this is the earliest object we have. The needle case in this exhibit. The needle case is 1814. It's engraved. It says Haven on it, and on the back and front. And Eliza Wentworth Haven um, received this in um, 1814. She was 20 years old. And possibly she received it on her on her birthday. I kind of like to think her fiance, um, oh, um, who was um, also. Nathaniel Haven Jr. Nathaniel A. Haven Jr. was her fiance, but he was waiting to go take his sister on a trip to Europe, and because of the War of 1812, his trip to Europe was postponed, and he kept they kept they put off their marriage for a couple of years, and so I, I like to think this might have been a gift from him um, while they're waiting for the wedding, but there's absolutely no evidence of that. Um, Eliza Wentworth Haven was important in her own right. She um, was, it, he died in 1826. Their son died um, as a young adult and left um, a bequest to the Athenaeum and a request, a bequest for Puss's school. The, um, fa so the family was always interested in education. They had a lot of money. Um, she and her, and her husband were first cousins. Um, they were both, their grandfather was Samuel Haven, who was the minister of South Church. And they lived in the Samuel Haven house, um, which his father had purchased at, um, and basically bought out his siblings. And so the two of them lived in their, their grandfather's house. And, and um, she, in the nine years they were married, she had seven children. Um, only, only three of them were still alive. <laughs> at, at when he died in 1826, the son who died in early adulthood and two daughters that outlived her. So one of the daughters went to Smith College. Um, both of the daughters were involved in philanthropy and educational institutions. And Eliza herself left $1,000 to establish the Athenaeum's Eliza Haven Fund. And she was the very first woman to purchase her own share of the Athenaeum in 1860. Women who had been members before that were spouses that had inherited their shares um, from or, or daughters, they had inherited their shares from fathers or spouses. But she purchased her own share in 1860. So was the Haven House the one on River Mall? Yes, it, well, it was on, on it faced Pleasant. It was, oh, on, yeah, it was faced in Haven right. Park. Yeah. And, and after the last daughter died, and the heirs sold it to the C 
city and it got made into a park. And the house so got the torn house, down. The house was torn down. So, um, <laughs> the, uh, the other two things in this case are also fairly early. The, the collar over here, this um, was embroidered by Priscilla Hall Badger, um, and she, um, we have a, a couple of other things by her, and there's a sampler by her, which we don't own, um, that's in, listed in the book of Fort Smith samplers. But this was embroidered by her, came to her from um, the, Mrs. Hersey, who were um, cousins of like a couple of generations removed. And she had married Bracket Hutchings, who was a Portsmouth druggist and apothecary. So this is the kind of, this is kind of a, a middle class mercantile family um, where Bracket Hutchings had become a proprietor of the Athenaeum. They weren't among the wealthiest, but this collar is definitely um, sort of an extravagant um, display of embroidery. This collar um, was worn and belonged to Mary McFedris Warner Connor Harris, who was married in the parlor of the Warner House in 1820. This is, it, um, this one, the documentation says it's from 1822 and it came from Paris. We know her husband, Theodore Harris, went to Europe shortly after their marriage and then came back. He went to Mobile and then the ha Le Havre. Um, on a, a merchant voyage. That's sort of what he did every other year. And so it's possible that he brought it back to her um, and she probably wore it but um, kept it as a memento um, of her early marriage. And this belongs to, right now it belongs to the Portsmouth Historical Society, but it's being given to the Warner House. We exchanged it for a sampler. Um, actually it's two, three samplers, we exchanged it for three samplers because we have the capabilities of keeping the samplers and displaying them and and they weren't within the Warner House's collecting priority, but this is very much within the Warner House's collecting priority. So we're having, we had a, a rearrangement. <laughs> and, he, and part of what, uh, as part of the rearrangement, I had the collar conserved, so it's all ready to go to the Warner House now. So after, so then I, I told the Carolyn Roy, well, I'm going to, borrow it back, <laughs> yeah. even though it hasn't gotten to the Warner House yet. So <laughs> this is going to go to the Warner House. Will they display it? Do you think? Um, we will display it at the Warner House sometimes, but it'll probably be resting for a little while after being out here all summer. So now <laughs> the bass? Oh, the bass. I, that is just one I selected to go under. Um, it's in the 1840s, and it, it actually has a skirt and a, a big pelerine. Mm -hmm. Can you look at the waist? I know, it's like so tiny. <laughs> but it was the most neutral thing I could find. M most neutral thing I could find. <laughs> Never for me. <laughs> oh, yeah. It had to be clean. It was, it was gray. It was, it was she's dark. No. It was a slack. So I'm going to talk about our one piece of gentleman's clothing here. Um, this is Edmund Roberts' coat. And this is from the eight, about 1830 in silk. It is supposedly a coat that he wore when he um, was negotiating the trade treaty with Muscat and Siam, um, two, two different treaties. And this is the treaty with Muscat. This is his copy of it. And it, um, the Historical Society has had this and all the Edmund Roberts things since the 1930s. Um, we do keep the treaty here um, at the Athenaeum in the vault, um, and it had to get it had broken plexi, so it had to get fixed for this exhibit. But it, it does generally stay here because it's um, a rare thing. There's another copy in Washington, and presumably there's a copy in Muscat as well somewhere. This, um, in Muscat became Oman, and it, um, this treaty stayed in effect until 1958, which is really quite amazing for life for a trade treaty. And we have this is, this is a picture of Edmund Roberts here that he had made in his youth in England. And although the, the frame says Paris, but he wrote a letter saying he just had his picture done in, when he was in England uh, in 1804. And he says wax is a beautiful mode for taking a likeness. But as such things are apt to do, mine, I think, rather flatters me. <laughs> oh, well, that was nice. He was certainly you know, was not too. lacking in confidence. <laughs> and Evan Roberts had, he, he, he inherited a fortune from his uncle, 
and he was known for being very aristocratic in behavior, and, um, but he was always losing money. He, he married Catherine Whipple Langdon, the youngest daughter of Woodbury Langdon, and, and he and Catherine lived with her mother, with um, Sarah Sherburn Langdon, at the um, Rockingham Mansion that Woodbury had built for a number of years. And then they rented other mansions around town. When you read about what they were renting, they were renting you know, large houses with large gardens, but they didn't have any money most of the time <laughs> because he kept losing money on ships. He was not a very bad, good businessman. So getting a government job was um, difficult. It was. It was. It was. Um, lots of the, you know, lots of the, um, the merchant families in Portsmouth that needed, that when, and when, up, when, when, trade, when trade declined, they joined the Army, the Navy, worked for the diplomatic corps. An awful lot of them were, they had connections, but not money. So they, they became like generals and admirals and were quite successful. So, yes, get a government job. <laughs> this, is a, this is a cashmere shawl. This is the only real cashmere shawl among our collection of roughly 40 shawls at the John Paul Jones house. Because um, we have a bunch of silk ones and a bunch of paisley ones. Um, but this is the only one that's really made of cashmere. Um, woven in India. But um, the style could date to as early as like 1815. But we know from Edmund Roberts' documentation, his letters back to his daughters and his inventory, because he died. In, after this treaty was delivered back to Oman, he um, was on his way to China. And he, the ship was in Macau. And he got yellow fever, and he died. Oh, yes, but in, in his in, in the previous letters, he had wrote to his daughters that a number of things had sold, because he had sent some things to France to sell, including a box of pearls but not the cashmere shawl and shawls. And, and then in inventory, there's a box of shawls and scarves. So we think that this is, it came with a note saying that he brought it from India. And his only trip to India was when he was taking this treaty. Afterwards, he stopped in India. And, and there's a whole description by the doctor on the ship about meeting with the shawl merchants and picking out shawls and you know, quite descriptive. So we think this shawl is, is a product of that. Um, so it's, it's a little worse for wear, but it's still a lovely shawl. Two years to weave a shawl like this by the method they used for cashmere shawls. So. I'm sorry, did you say two years? Two years. Two years. So I'll discuss the one other, this is one other gentleman's item here. I, I allow that a sword would be an, an item of apparel for a gentleman so that you wear them. This is um, Frederick Potter's sword. And Frederick Potter was a doctor. And at the beginning of the Civil War, he was at the Kings County Hospital, um, and in, in, which is Kings Brooklyn. County, it's Brooklyn. And he was, they gave him this Navy sword in 1861, although the sword is um, from 1852. It's one of a group of swords that Congress commissioned to give to officers in the Navy. So it may have belonged to someone else first, or it may have been an undistributed sword. Um, I found out last year when the sword expert came to visit us that these are relatively valuable. And you know, we kind of up in the attic with the other swords <laughs> on the table with a piece of acid on, nothing special. So it's, um, it got to, to come be exhibited. And Frederick Potter um, was a proprietor in the Athenaeum. And he was also a director of the Athenaeum. And in 1895, he donated the large Ulysses S. Tenney copy of the Pepperell painting that's down in the reading room here. So he was very interested in the early history. Um, he also wrote the um, Military History of New Hampshire, which is one of the most tedious books. I had to read a whole chunk of it for the War of 1812. And um, it was a, a, a a good undertaking because he really got everything together. It's very tedious reading. So I'm going to have to forgive him because he gave us the Pepperell portrait. But, <laughs> um, he, uh, and the, the shawl belonged to his wife, um, Harriet Potter. And this shawl dates to about 1830 to 1840. So it could well have belonged to Harriet's mother um, because she's giving it to us in the 1930s. 
and they're here in Portsmouth in the 1880s and 90s. This is a printed Shaw. Um, you can see, this is probably a woven one that Hannah Rogers has on. This is a printed Shaw. This is a, a, a less expensive version. But this is, this is the one shawl in our collection that was actually cataloged. Cat Cashmere shawl, fancy bordered. <laughs> it is a regular wool shawl, <laughs> but they printed bordered. <laughs> so, um, and and they, were, they were printed um, Edinburgh and in London. So they were a, a variety of places this could have been printed. Um, and they were sold here. Was that usually here. done later? Oh, no, this no. is 1830 to 1840. They were printing pretty early. About They were printing as early as they were weaving because it was always, uh, it was a lot quicker to print a shawl than it was to weave one. So more people could afford those. Too. Right, because even when you're weaving, uh, well, you have two years for this one, and so therefore not that many made. When you're weaving them with a draw loom, um, 1830s, it's going to take you from, from two weeks to two months to weave one. And then once you get the jacquard loom um, with the Paisley shawls in Paisley and other places, um, it's going to take you from two weeks to two days. Do them in two days. Sometimes some little complicated ones take longer, but so you're really you're speeding up shawl weaving um, throughout the process. You know, given we have so many shawls, I had to bring some shawls. Yeah. <laughs> and then I'll, I'll talk about the last shawl over here. This shawl is a Chinese silk shawl. Um, and so this is the alternative to a paisley shawl. And the, you'd also probably wear these in the winter, excuse me, in the summer. Um, almost everybody um, seems to have had both. And this one's unusual because it's gold, and gold ones were generally more expensive than the white ones or the black ones. And it came to us from Bertha Vaughn, who was one of the women who was, purchased her own proprietorship in the early 20th century. The shawl dates probably to 1830 to 40. Um, so it probably did belong to her mother. Um, she also donated the chair, which isn't part of the show, but I said, well, I need a chair and have a shawl. I might as well bring one that she donated. <laughs> so I fetched it. I actually, it was on exhibit, so I had to rearrange things and brought it down. And now we come to the dress everybody loves. Um, this is um, Mariah Salter, Mariah Lowe Salter. Um, her father was um, Henry Salter. Her mother was Mariah Lowe. And this dress was made for the, her 1844 wedding to William Preston. And she, um, but it, this dress is remade. Um, everyone who's looked at this dress knows it's basically underneath is, is turned over. And it, it's thought that possibly her mother did the embroidery on it um, a generation earlier. So it's from the 1820s. Also, the sleeve embroidery is different from this embroidery. So if you had a dress in the 1820s, it would have had pretty big sleeves. So you easily could have remade it. You know, just made basically a couple, use the, the sleeves and make a whole new top for it. Um, and if it were, you know, it might have been a higher waisted dress like that. Because you know, there's extra of this skirt material in the bodice. Um, Sandra, could, could, um, could the mother have done that, or would they have gone to some special seamstress to, to remake it? To make the dress? Probably a dressmaker to make the dress, um, if the family had money. But if you, you're, if you were skilled at dressmaking, you could do your own. But most people employed a dressmaker to do it. And here we have William Preston, um, her husband, husband of the dress. <laughs> and Tom, <laughs> he's a... Um, he, he was painted, this is a posthumous painting, um, done in 1879, shortly after his death. And he was um, a druggist, one of his, um, and he was actually a fairly staid person, except that he was arrested for, for out selling alcohol, because he was selling patent medicine, and he actually invented a kind of patent medicine, which is mostly alcohol. And he was, um, he, he was sort of a test case, he knew he was going to get arrested. So that caused a great deal of furor in town. And then he died very dramatically at the music hall during a performance. Um, probably had a stroke or aneurysm or something Drank like so much, that. too much of his medicine. Oh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so so that, was, that was also kind of a big deal in the papers, the sudden death. And, and so they had this painted, Ulysses Tenney painted this. 
And we have a photograph, a copy of a photograph. The painting sitting sort of like in a shrine, and there's a chair in, in his, with his empty chair next to it. And Mariah is sitting next to it, and they take this picture of Mariah sitting next to her dead husband's portrait. Aww. Yes, it's, it's sad, but she lived quite a long while after she did. Yeah, poor Mariah. So I think I'm just going to keep going around, even though chronologically none. This is a wedding dress. Um, Mary Morrison May. Ma uh, Mary Morrison married James Rundlett May in 1881 at the John Paul Jones house, which is the house shown in that picture. Um, that's a copy of painting that's at um, Historic New England's Rundlet May House. And many of the things that were owned by Samuel Lord, who was Mary Morrison's grandfather, and who owned the um, John Paul Jones house for mo much of the 19th century. Mo uh, many of the furnishings were inherited by Mary and are at the Runlet May house. <laughs> so, the, um, so she got married at the, at the John Paul Jones house. And two years later, when Ralph May, her son, who was also a proprietor, her, both her father and her grandfather, Samuel Lord, was a proprietor, her husband, James Runlet May, was a proprietor, and her son, Ralph May, was a proprietor. When Ralph was born in 1883, Mary came home to the John Paul Jones house to have Ralph. It is three blocks from the Runlet May house to the John Paul Jones house, so we do think she was being a trifle extreme. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> It's, um, her mother could have walked up to the Runlet May house, but no, she came home to have the baby. Um, and this is, um, you know, a very classic 1880s, um, a fancy 1880s dress. Here, over here, we have a 1901, uh, and this is the labelless wonder here, which I forgot to do the label. I forgot to send the label to get made. Um, this is 1901. Um, Sarah Rebecca Roberts married Charles W. Gray, who owned Consolidated Coal down at the edge of Prescott Park. And Charles um, W. Gray also gave the Athenaeum most of the half scale models that are downstairs. Mm -hmm. He collected those. And he collected um, canes, which the Historical Society has a very large collection of canes that came from Charles W. Gray. So this is um, their wedding night, her wedding night night dress. Oh. Washing and ironing. Yeah, I know, but that's a lot of work. Um, and over here, we have, this is one of our more recent proprietors. This is Helen Haven Langdon and some uh, me family members. I'm probably in the way here. Um, so the blue bodice belonged to um, Helen Haven Langdon's mother, who was Helen Ball Haven Langdon. And she died, of, she married Francis Eustace Langdon and died of tuberculosis in 1874. Frank Langdon then didn't work a day after that, pretty much. He had been a, a physician. And he spent the rest of his life hanging out at the Athenaeum. Um, and it was said his favorite activity was choosing books for the Athenaeum. He, his brother, and he lived at the Langdon house, at the Governor John Langdon mansion with his mother, Francis Bassett um, Langdon. Um, Francis, and is it, that, that Francis is an interesting story because she bought the, you know, the story is Woodbury bought it and gave it to his mother. That's not true. His mother bought it and gave it to Woodbury. Um, the, um, um, Women never get the credit, right? <laughs> well, Francis, 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 um, she was Francis Cutter. She married a, one of the Woodbury Langdons. He was killed in a duel in New Orleans when they were fairly young, but she didn't have but any money. She went to Boston, started a boarding house. She married her richest boarder, oh, Mr. Bassett, and, and that's how Woodbury and Frank got Harvard educations, mm -hmm. and how Woodbury got started in banking in New York. It's she through was his mother's marriage. She was woman. She was, <laughs> she was. And so Woodbury kind of took out, you know, he was the one that had the sense for money in the family, Frank um, didn't, and and also then got really depressed when his wife died and spent his life. But that is his wife's, and that was passed down to his daughter. And that's 1868 about. And it's also, you can tell she wasn't very well. It's because it's lined. It's heavily lined inside, like you want to keep off drafts. It's a very strange thing. Uh, 
sleeve. Yes. Yes. And and the mannequin was made for different sleeves, so that's why it sort of looks weird. But the um, and then Helen Haven Langdon, who was one of Frank's daughter, was Frank's only daughter. He had also had a son. Um, she studied as an artist with Henry Snell, whom nobody here has ever heard of, and certainly I hadn't either, but he's apparently fairly well-known impressionist in Philadelphia. And she went to Europe quite often for um, studying art, summers, and she painted, sold her paintings. She came back to Portsmouth. She lived in Boston a lot in the winter. Um, she ended up living at what is known as the Treadwell Cutter Langdon House, the house that used to be where Jumpin' Jays is now, that was torn down in the 1950s. And it was, and, and she left it, Helen Haven Langdon was the last of the family to own it. She let, well no, she left it to her great niece who didn't get full control of it until she was 30. And then she sold it to Charles Dale who was oh, the, the yeah. previous yeah. governor, the yeah. Prescott's lawyer, yeah. who promised not to tear it down and who promptly tore it down. And that story was told to me by the donor of these things, Pamela Page, who was um, the great niece's daughter. Mm -hmm. and, and she appeared on our doorstep about three years ago with all of these things and an 18th century silk man suit. Um, and we don't know who it belongs to, but it's all looking wonderful. And and the, the, the really funny thing is that Pamela Page is from Guilford, Connecticut, where I used to live, and her ex-sister-in-law lived across the street from me. Oh, oh. <laughs> so it's a, it is a very small world. Yes, Pam, she lives in uh, Massachusetts. Sandra, I think, was it Richard Candy? Somebody said that that house that was torn down had a lot to do with the beginning yes, of it the did. concerns about historic right. preservation right. in Portsmouth. Yeah. Right. Because they certainly built an ugly building. Well, I mean, even though it's a great restaurant. Uh, yes. So the anyway. fan it belonged from Hel came from Helen's family and is is a nineteenth century fan. And but the hat is about nineteen thirty five, and that was Helen's hat. And the shirt up there is a Paris shirt. We don't know if Helen got it. It's made by the Charvette Shirt Company, which is still one of the most famous shirt companies. They were the first ones to make bespoke shirts in Paris for men at first and then for women. It is beautifully made. I, I would love to have a Charvette shirt. It was like, it was like a, although it was a rather a chore to iron it, but. Uh, and that's, it dates it to, I dated it after 1921 because that's when Charvette went to the address on the label. So it's. Um, it, it survived washing very nicely. It's in great shape. And Helen made these paper dolls from the old, the old curiosity shop. And I am looking for artwork by her. Because she painted... Um, What's her name again? Helen Haven Langdon. Okay. Huh. <laughs> Over here, we have... This is from the second drawers, which I have very discreetly folded here. And the chemise, which is lovely, um, came from Phyllis Hodgson. Phyllis Hodgson was an art teacher here in Portsmouth for many years. Um, did anybody go to school in Portsmouth and have Phyllis as an art teacher? Well, I'm too young, but my parents did. Your parents did. Really? Okay. Well, she taught for a really long time. She, and so, and she, was, she died in 1992. And she was, she was um, a proprietor on her own. Um, her family had not historically been proprietors of the Portsmouth Avenue, and she joined. She was very interested in cultural activities, lectured for the DAR, the Historical Society, traveled a lot to Europe. She traveled to Scandinavia, Russia, Finland, Alaska, and she would come back and give travelogue talks about her journeys, because um, there are newspaper articles galore announcing her lectures. And it, but, and she taught art. But I taught two people that I know um, who are different ages had her as an art teacher here in Portsmouth. And both of them, and they're very different personalities, and both of them said she was scary. <laughs> so I, so as a teacher, I'm not sure. But she was head of the art department for, for the Portsmouth High School for quite a long while. Um, and why she chose to give her, you know, she's apparently a very prim and proper person in many ways. 
and why she chose to give her stuff in drawers is <laughs> insane. And they were from either from her mother or when she was um, a teenager. Um, the stuff in drawers are made by the Marcella company, There's, and it's called the skirt drawer in the label. And the um, chemise, it says on our documentation, it's handmade, but I'm not certain about that. It's machine sewn, certainly. But um, they're quite nice looking. The fan comes from da um, Daniel Borthwick, who gave us lots of stuff. Uh, but this is the only thing remotely clothing. And it's um, this is a Chinese ivory brise fan. Brise refers to the carving. And the um, it's, you know, the fan is probably 1820 to 1850 and came from his family. And the interesting thing about Daniel Borthwick is that he was, and he, Borthwick Avenue is named after him. Um, he was active in a lot of different things in town. But he was one of the founders of Historical Society. And it was Daniel himself, not Mrs. Borthwick, it was Daniel who was rounding up stuff to give the Historical Society and bringing things that belong. You know, he would go and visit the elderly ladies who he knew had stuff, and he would bring stuff back to the Historical Society. And, and we don't have any, any mention, really, of his wife um, giving things. It was Daniel giving those things. And then we have the beaded purse. You want to know about the beaded purse. Um, I think it's 1890s, um, and made in Europe. And, the, um, and it belonged to Martha Kimball. She inherited her share from her father, Edward Pace and Kimball. They had lots of money, lived up on Union Street um, in a very large house that's now condos. Um, but she devoted, so she didn't need to work. She went to Smith College, and then she devoted herself to causes, and her, her primary cause was women's suffrage. And she was one of the people responsible for bringing the League of Women Voters to New Hampshire. What's and your name again? Martha Smith Kimball. And she, um, she eventually moved to Florida um, and lived the last 15 years or so of her life in Florida. Um, she had um, the, um, the, well, lots of the people working for women's suffrage are sort of identified as sort of feminist leaders. Martha was, she was definitely that, but the, the newspapers talk about the party she gives for her friends and the clothing they're wearing. And she wears these really wonderful sounding outfits um, for little afternoon parties, um, usually in, in favor of you know, promoting women's suffrage and things like that. Causes. Meanwhile, on Pleasant Street, Mrs. Wendell, mm -hmm. we have upstairs invitations to an anti-suffrage tea. <laughs> 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 oh, really? Mm -hmm. oh, dear. I would so destroy one's place in the family. And, uh, uh, and Martha, Martha never married. And Phyllis Hodgson never married. And Helen Haven Langdon never married. So we have prime, uh, proprietors, women who are, and Bertha Vaughn didn't marry. So we have women as, as proprietors who usually didn't marry. But you have to tell us about that. Oh, I'm going to. Okay. When I get to the black, it goes with the black. Okay. Thing. First, I'm going to tell you about Virginia Tanner, who is, an, who is a woman who did things, um, was employed, but who did marry. <laughs> um, this dress, our documentation, and Virginia Tanner herself gave us this dress. Um, Virginia Tanner Green. She says this dress was ordered from New York for a presentation at the Court of St. James in London. And we don't know if she actually got presented. I can't find a passport record for her. But she could have gone with one, and she would have been 16 or 17 at the time, in the late 1890s. And she could have gone with one of her aunts, one of her father's sisters. They came from a prominent Virginia family. Um, her mother's family was from Massachusetts, well off, but not, um, not the sort of family that went off to get presented in England. So it would have been her father's family had, had that happen. Um, but the dress is made of Irish lace. Rona tells me the nuns in Ireland are busy making this lace. Um, and it's got a silk underlining, a skirt and the bodice. We had it conserved, and the man, a Swedish shaper made all of these mannequins. Um, and the, um, so she is so, um, she was really thin. And, and our conservator, Nina Rayer, says, 
she could not have moved. I mean, the dress looks pretty sexy, but when, um, but then you couldn't move in it. It's got skinny, skinny arms, and it's got because the lace, it's got like a silk lining in the arms, so you, it doesn't stretch like the lace stretches a little bit. And she said you would practically have to be carried somewhere in this dress. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, and but Virginia Tanner was trained as a dancer, and she taught dance. She taught modern dance. And she also was a pageant writer. And she wrote the pageant of Portsmouth. So we have the pageant of Portsmouth there. And for the tercentenary in 1923, um, she had, was already married to Lawrence Green, but she didn't use, she used Virginia Tanner, even though she was a married woman. She still used her maiden wow. name, very forward looking. And, and she, um, she also wrote a pageant for Machias Maine and a pageant for Bath, Maine, when they got the bridge, the, um, and the, the um, bridge in Bath. Um, she put a pageant for the town of Bath for the bridge. Wow. So she was, um, you know, a person who was out doing things during her married life, which is pretty unusual. They lived in um, Massachusetts during the winters and summered in Newcastle. So she, um, by writing the pageant, and all. Yes. She did yes. Yes. It says she over here. It says that she um, she wrote and directed it. And um, she's um, and she you know all the scenes and she and she writes about how she and she, another thing about how she picked that picked out the what scenes to represent. Some of them are pretty fictitional, but fictitious. But um, and 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 Edmund Tarbell drew the cover of the pageant. Tarbell. Oh. And she was friends with Tarbell. They both lived in Newcastle. And there is a poster, which um, Bob Chase says he has this poster, but he can't find it, um, that Tarbell did for um, the pageant. Yeah. Wow. Gosh. Yeah. That's true. There were so many artists summering up yes, here. Yes, there were. Yeah. Lots of whole, uh, whole screen. So now we come to the black mm. mint, the black jet mantelette. Um, this piece belonged to Susan Wentworth. So here we connect the old families of Portsmouth with the new families of Portsmouth. Susan um, Wentworth's father, Mark Hunking Wentworth, who was a descendant of the Wentworths, and who ended up inheriting the John Wentworth house. Um, his, Mark Hunking Wentworth's father, Ebenezer, had bought the John Wentworth house sort of and sort of gathered Wentworth things and preserved the the Wentworth name in um, Portsmouth. So Mark Hunky Wentworth owned the house that's next to the Langdon house called the Thomas Thompson house. And it's also a little bit up the street from, and across the street from the John Wentworth house. And that's where they actually lived. When Mark Hunky Wentworth died, he left his fortune to establish the Mark Wentworth um, Home for the Aged, which now has a new name that I can never remember. It's assisted living now. Um, greatly expanded, but there, a lot of their money went to um, fund that um, charity. And the, um, he had made the fortune in Cincinnati. He didn't make this fortune in Portsmouth. He went to Cincinnati as a young man, made a fortune in, a, in dry goods, wholesale dry goods merchandising, um, and then came back to Portsmouth. And he was married to two sisters as well, um, first one dying, and then he married the second sister. Um, so, and actually, I believe, Susan's named after the first wife, but I think she's the daughter of the second wife. So Susan was, um, <laughs> she lived until 1940. Um, she was born in 1846, so she, she lived a, a good long time. This dates to about, in, to the 1880s. Um, Astrida and I had a long discussion about you know, where in the, eight, you know, like, so did we think the late 1880s, because it's not um, of, the, of the, the small sleeves, um, and it ha but it does have a bustly thing in the back. If you look at the back of it, it has like could go over a, a bustle. Um, it's made out of the, the fabric with the jet beads sewed on it is um, yard goods. Um, if you look in the seams, they ha that has jet in it too. So the material came with the jet already oh, sewed yeah. on, this part, this material. It's lined with silk, and then there's a Chantilly lace, 
and then the jet is is on. And it looks like I need to do a little sewing here. <laughs> I'm not sure this is going to make it through the whole 30 months. Other than if this has been normally lying down. You normally have to keep these lying down. This may be the only time this is displayed ever um, because they're so heavy. Uh, it's, a, it's called a mantelet. It's um, kind of more than a cape and less than a coat. Um, the, the, it has like elastic things under the arms. So you kind of put your arms into it as if you were putting on a coat. And it's, but it's very tight in the sleeves, in the, in the, what would, would be sleeves. So you can't really move very much in it. <laughs> and you would you wear this to something like the opera and, or to a fancy evening party where I think you would take it off um, when you got there. Um, I can't see actually, you know, unless you're just standing there, I can't see wearing <laughs> it the whole time. And along with the mantelet goes the parasol. Oh, oh it's um, This is... You know, it's black silk. Would black silk be very good for keeping the sun off? Would it not, <laughs> would it not fade? Um, and, uh, or as a side from absorbing the heat. Um, so it probably didn't get put up much. This actually is very sturdy. I didn't put it quite all the way up, but you can put it up. Um, and it's got yellow silk lining. This is the, what is now sort of beige here is part of the yellow silk lining. And it's very bright yellow underneath. Trimmed with the Chantilly lace again. She, she must have loved it. She must have loved it. And then a tie on the top. And this is 1890s um, for the parasol. And so she would have carried this for afternoon visits and maybe put it up occasionally. Mostly to impress people. But for her afternoon at the yeah. Athenaeum. Not when she was running that way, right? Yeah, she inherited her share from her father. But she remained um, a benefactor of the Athenaeum. Oh, and I have one last dress to talk about over here. <laughs> the little girl. The little girl. Um, this is um, from about 1850, and our documentation said it was made in Paris. Um, it's certainly fancy enough to have been made in Paris. It's wool and silk with all that fancy cording and the smocking and the tucks. And, um, it belonged to Susan Thompson Dwight. She was the only child of William Lyman Dwight and Adeline Rice, who is... Um, Adeline um, Rice Dwight is a sister to Sarah Parker Goodwin, um, the governor's wife. So, and, and, and they, the family had plenty of money, and this was their only child, so it would, sh they could have afforded a dress from Paris. And Susan um, Thompson Dwight married Arthur Yates, and they lived on Middle Street. So they, um, but she inherited her father's share and remained. Um, a proprietor after that. So she was actually a proprietor herself, not, not through her husband. And we have the portrait of Uzo, the photograph of the Athenian boys up there, um, showing how, how Athenian boys dressed when they came to sit in the Athenian. And this is 1891, I think. Um, yeah, June of 1891. So they're sitting down in the reading room with their paintings. And one of them is Frederick Potter. Um, this is Frederick Potter on the end here of the sword. That's good. Yeah. So that's the end. And we have time for some questions, even. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are the sleeves sewn to the bodice? Hmm? You cannot lift your arms in that? Not very, no. It's, they're they're kind attached. of not really, they're kind of just like, oh. So you can't lift up the sleeve? No. It's they're attached. a confined cape like thing. Oh. Oh, I know. Right. I know. Yeah, so it's not like a cape where you can sort of fly. No, it's very confined. Yeah. Except for like a grand entrance and a grand exit. Maybe. Yes, definitely. And, and, you know, like obviously Virginia Tanner's dress is for a grand entrance and a grand exit, too. But my, I think my favorite thing is Helen Haven Langdon's pair of shirts. This one. Mm. Yes. Okay. Yes. Because then it was good. Actually, using that today. Yes. Well, is that for her husband? No, it was her shirt. It was her shirt. Yeah, because they um, Charvet started making women's shirts in the 1870s. So she could have bought it on her trips to Europe, or she could have bought it. They also ex um, the fancy stores in New York um, imported them from Paris. And what would she wear that with? A skirt and a jacket, probably. Mm -hmm. um, so it looks brand new. 
Señor.